health. So in many instances, there are the, the elements or the uh, different components of a communications disaster kind of baked into to our disaster. It's a, high, it's a crisis event. There's high, higher public emotions in the beginning. The kind of fog of war limits access to facts. And now we add into that rumor, gossip, speculation, and such, and we get a very unstable information environment. Now, all of us can appreciate that people are being bombarded with information at this point if there's cellular service and if there's power um, because they're getting it from so many sources and getting it in real time. Good information, bad information, misinformation, all of this blended together. And we know it's just so critical to get information out right the first time uh, because what research tells us over and over is it's very hard to unscare people after they begin reacting. And uh, one of the best case examples of this is people's reactions to the earlier medical journal uh, articles linking something like vaccines to autism. And uh, still there's a whole generation of young parents who are not going to ever believe otherwise. But we have opportunities during the crisis and we have opportunities before crises uh, in which community engagement can really help us change those dynamics. During a, a crisis, obviously the target of our, our communications uh, should be to increase the public's knowledge about the situation, their understanding about the situation, and, and what needs to be done to enhance their trust and, and view of credibility for our responders and our, uh, our governments and to establish dialogue and availability that you know, we want this to be a, a two-way street, that we're doing this with the community, we're not doing it uh, to the community. Now, very quickly, that distinction, of course, between crisis communication or miscommunication. Crisis communication is more proactive, um, or rather risk communication, rather. Something bad in advance we're telling you is, is going to happen, so we, we're giving you instructions or recommendations as opposed to crisis communications in which the thing has happened and here's what we're doing now. Now, community engagement actually plays an incredible role in both of those. And we know it's very important to have that pre-event engagement because once something is going down, especially in our current information age, mental noise theory just overwhelms, uh, is an overwhelming dynamic. Uh, people are being bombarded, and we just know at a brain science level that our ability to, to process all that information, it starts to slide. It starts to diminish very quickly. Um, so the work you can do pre-event pays very good dividends because communicating during a crisis, well, you, you're compromised, uh, not just by your own busyness and your overwhelming uh, task list, but now you're compromised because on the receiving end of your messaging, People receive information differently, they process it differently, and they act on it differently. But we have a chance to influence that pre-event. So I want to give you from the behavioral sciences one example of how we see this. And I'm just going to focus on some of the key points of what's known as the extended parallel processing model. It talks a little bit about how people process crisis-related information, and I think that could be helpful for our discussion and helpful for your thinking about community engagement. When people are presented with crisis-related information, very quickly, talking about split seconds, they run that information through two cognitive filters. The first is, re is regards, uh, or referred to as, as concern, and the second is referred to as confidence. And in concern, people are listening to information about the threat or the hazard, and they're really listening to two levels. Severity, you know, how big and bad is this? Should I really be worried? And susceptibility, does it have anything to do with me or is it about only very young children or only about the elderly or such right now? Well, if it is about them, if it's about them and it sounds pretty serious, the next level of thinking, and I'm speaking about this very quickly and somewhat subconsciously, is the filter of confidence, also referred to here as efficacy. And their confidence, the first filter, is confidence in themselves to handle the situation. And the second is confidence in officials or leaders' ability to handle the situation. So you see this as a schematic very quickly. We see that when the message is, if they don't rise to a certain level, the message is rejected. People don't take the actions you want or need them to take. So it's important that people hear both of those messages. Now, please look at where that star is. It's in that upper right quadrant. And what that says is we get the best response from people in responding to crises when they actually have a high degree of concern 
that the situation is serious and it affects them, but they also have a high degree of confidence that both they and their community leaders or their bosses know how to handle this. What this says to us is that sometimes a, a leader, a community leader, or even a business leader's impulse to help calm people, it can actually backfire. Because if we sugarcoat it and people don't really understand the degree of threat, it doesn't put them up into that quadrant, up into that sweet spot where we get that response. So for people to prepare and respond effectively, it is important to have a degree of threat, but also to understand that they have a degree of readiness and our communities have a degree of readiness to handle the situation. Uh, and then we talk about this concept. This is from Dr. Peter Sandman, who this famous uh, statement, action binds anxiety. That it's incredibly important to give people instructions then, pre-event, but then during the event as well, about what to do, what to do pre-event, what to do if we have the crisis, what to do next. We know that when people are left without those sort of directions, well, on a good day, we know disasters and crises strip power and control away from people, but we know that if we're not getting that instruction, that anxiety can be overwhelming, and actually, you've seen this in your work, people can become more, you know, more of the problem than the solution. So we're trying to keep people on that side of the equation where they're part of the solution. One thing we know about ambiguity is if we're not certain yet, it's always better to be upfront about that in our communications and our messaging. Uh, to say we don't know yet, that there may be more information or the information may change. Because if you speak with absolute certainty and then we have to go back and update or change information, very often it can undermine public confidence. You know, they told us this yesterday and now everything's changed. 